Now more than ever, Israel's crimes against Palestinians are center stage, laid bare for the world to see. Thank God for social media because it appears to me that the world is finally waking up. To shut down the growing Palestine solidarity movement and silence opposition to Zionism, Israel and its supporters are leaning even more heavily on a tactic they've been using for years. Growing reports of anti-Semitic attacks and slurs calling out anti-Semitism. I'm terrified to wear this outside. First of all, anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. But you'll be surprised to find out that quite a few countries claim that criticizing Israel's state ideology, Zionism, is a form of anti-Jewish bigotry. L'antisionism is one of the forms modern of antisemitism. They've adopted this position by endorsing and implementing something called the IHRA definition of antisemitism. Anthony Blinken enthusiastically embracing the IHRA's working definition. The IHRA definition of antisemitism says it is anti-Semitic. The issue, really, is the working examples, which are never really Before we get to the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, let's go over a key word. Despite what its supporters would have you believe, Zionism is not some feel-good personal identity that many people in Western countries embrace as a form of self-expression. I am Mexican, I am Jewish, and I am damn proud to be a Zionist. I am a proud Zionist. I'm not going to stop saying it. The Zionist cause have built a safe home for Jews like us. One anti-Zionist Jewish activist put it perfectly when they said, what terrifies Zionists is the thought that anyone can unlearn Zionism at any time, that it is not an identity, but an ideology, a settler colonial ideology that goes way back. The Zionist movement began in Europe, where Jews had been facing persecution for centuries. The first Zionists were actually fundamentalist anti-Semitic Protestants who wanted Jews to leave Europe. Politicians then picked up the ideology. Zionism was rejected by the vast majority of Jewish leaders, especially rabbis. What galled the anti-Zionist Jews the most, however, was that Zionism also shared the solution to the Jewish question and that anti-Semites had always advocated, namely, the expulsion of Jews from Europe. But in the 19th century, Theodor Herzl, a Jewish journalist and activist from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, adopted the idea. Theodor Herzl. He wrote The Jewish State in 1896, where he laid down a colonialist, secular, and nationalistic vision for a Jewish homeland. In the book, he weighs the movement's options for colonization. He considers Argentina because of the land's fertility, size, climate, and sparse population. And he considers Palestine because its religious significance, quote, would attract our people with a force of marvelous potency. The movement ended up settling on Palestine and announced the decision at the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897. Palestine. So the colonization of Palestine by European Jews began. Of course, no one consulted the Palestinians. At that time, Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire and had been for over 350 years. In 1917 came the Balfour Declaration. It's a letter from the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Arthur Balfour, to the Zionist movement, which promised British support for the Jewish colonization of Palestine. What's notable is that Balfour had long been an anti-Semite who had banned the emigration of Jews fleeing Russian pogroms into Britain. His support for Zionism was a fulfillment of Theodore Herzl's own prediction that, quote, the anti-Semites will become our most dependable friends. Soon after the Balfour Declaration, Britain occupied Palestine. 
At the start of the British Mandate, Jews made up about 8% of the population. This included Jews who had long lived in Palestine and who were not Zionists. And yet, over the coming years, the British would give Jewish settlers disproportionate political representation and would allow them to build up their own militias. Every colony has its watchtower, its system of defenses, and its organized body of soldier farmers. Palestinians began joining revolutionary groups and protesting Jewish colonization in Palestine, culminating in two major uprisings in 1929 and 1936, both of which were violently quashed by the British, and in some cases, Zionist paramilitary forces. And while all this was happening, an organization called the Jewish National Fund a land of the Jewish National Fund was creating a database with information on every Palestinian village and city, information that would be necessary during the next phase of ethnic cleansing. A turning point in history for the people of Palestine, the promised land. Between 1947 and 1948, Leaders of the Zionist movement executed a carefully prepared plan to force most of the Palestinian population out of their homes. Palestinians call this the Nakba, or the catastrophe. Ultimately, nearly 800,000 Palestinians were expelled or fled for their lives from over 500 cities, towns, and villages across Palestine. In carrying out this plan, Zionist militias perpetrated numerous massacres and atrocities. One such massacre was at Deir Yassin. The legend becomes a living reality. The militias involved in the Nakba would come to form Israel's army, and many militia leaders would become presidents, prime ministers, and war heroes. Today, many Israelis deny the Nakba, and the Israeli state tries to erase and obscure this history. For example, Israeli school textbooks describe the Deir Yassin massacre as a, quote, miracle, and as having solved a horrifying demographic problem. That's how Palestinians are still seen, as a demographic threat. That's why the ethnic cleansing hasn't stopped since 1948 and why so many Palestinians say that the Nakba has never ended. For more than seven decades, Israel has been bringing in settlers from around the world and telling them that they were, quote, coming home, while kicking Palestinians out of the homes they have lived in for generations. <laughs> Today, Palestinians are divided into three major groups. Millions live as refugees and exiles outside Palestine, forbidden from returning by Israel just because they aren't Jews. Those Palestinians and their descendants who managed to stay in what became Israel, about 1.5 million, live as second-class citizens at best, their lives hampered by violent repression and dozens of racist laws that favor Jews. Then there are millions of Palestinians living under Israeli military occupation and siege in the West Bank and Gaza, which Israel occupied along with Syria's Golan Heights in 1967. The occupation itself is not oppressive, as long as there is no resistance. <laughs> For decades in the occupied West Bank, Israel's army and settlers have been burning farms, expanding settlements, building walls and checkpoints, Are these from the arresting children, and executing Palestinians who try to resist, and even those who don't. In Gaza, Israel is besieging what is effectively the world's largest open-air prison, where half the population are children. 
Israel has counted their calories, controls their electricity and water, and bombs them mercilessly every few years. <laughs> or what Israeli leaders have called mowing the lawn. This is at the heart of what Zionism, Israel's state ideology, is. It necessitates erasing Palestinians and pushing them out of their homeland simply for not being Jewish. And that's happening under every single Israeli government, whether it labels itself left-wing or right-wing or centrist. And this is the reaction that we get from Israel's allies. We fully support Israel's legitimate right to defend itself. We call on all parties to end the violence. What we want to see is a two-state solution. It's not surprising. Western powers finance, trade with, and arm Israel. But these governments also share deep ideological ties of white supremacy, settler colonialism, and Western imperialism. Let's go back to Herzl for a second. He said he pitched the idea of a Jewish homeland to Britain because, quote, the idea of Zionism, which is a colonial idea, should be easily and quickly understood in England. It's in Palestine, Herzl says, that, quote, we should there form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. So it's no surprise that Israel enjoys the moral and material support of France and the UK, the countries that carved up and colonized the Middle East after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Israel is also supported by the USA, Canada, and Australia, which are all settler colonies also founded on the genocide and expulsion of indigenous peoples. And Israel is supported by European anti-Semitic far-right leaders, just as Herzl had anticipated. Zionism is a colonial ideology with a material history and bodies in its wake. It is violence, it is policy, it is law, it is impunity. Rejecting all that is what anti-Zionism is. And that's why the idea that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitic is so ridiculous. It might be more understandable if Zionism was an inherent part of being Jewish, but it's not. You have a tradition that is older that is bigger, that is more beautiful than colonialism, a tradition that is older than Zionism. Today, many Jewish people are anti-Zionists. And not all Zionists are Jewish. I am a Zionist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. In fact, even today, evangelical Christians make up the biggest base of support for Israel in the U.S. Christians United for Israel, the largest pro-Israel organization in the United States. They believe that the establishment of a Jewish state will bring about the end times. Participate in God's biblical mandate. So why do some claim that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism? Because it's a convenient way to deflect criticism of Israel's brutality against Palestinians. But if you want to win, we have to change our ways. We have to think differently. And this is waging a holistic campaign against the other side. Take him out of his comfort zone. Make him be on the defensive. Putting Palestinian solidarity activists on the defensive is exactly what the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism aims to do. The definition was released in 2016. The core definition it offers is vague, but it's the examples of anti-Semitism underneath which are problematic. Seven out of the 11 examples mention Israel by name. One example says, quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, e.g. by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, is an example of anti-Semitism. Let's address the Zionist myths being pushed here. The first being that the Jewish people have a right to self-determination, more commonly known as Israel's right to exist. Firstly, a state doesn't have rights. People have rights. 
And asking a Palestinian whose life is dictated by a state that occupies their land and dispossesses them, whether they believe Israel has a right to exist, is like asking a Native American whether the U.S. has a right to exist. The question is absurd. More importantly, if Israel's right to exist comes at the cost of Palestinian ethnic cleansing, expulsion, and occupation, then it most certainly does not have a right to exist. As for Israel being a racist endeavor... It's official. Israel is a state exclusively for Jews. Israel's committing crimes of apartheid and persecution in the occupied Palestinian territories. So yes, an ethnostate built on the ethnic cleansing of a native population, enacting apartheid, and occupying their land is a racist endeavor. And that would be the case whether or not the occupiers were Jewish. The IHRA offers a few other problematic examples of anti-Semitism, like applying double standards by requiring of Israel a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Well, an apartheid regime is not a democracy. And if anything, Israel is not held to any standards. Despite countless UN resolutions and human rights organizations accusing Israel of apartheid, illegal occupation, and settlement expansion, Israel has still not been sanctioned. So we can agree that this is a bad definition. And it's not just us who think so. It's, 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 as far as I can see, an attempt to stop people supporting the Palestinians. It's written in a way to be weaponized, to be used against human rights advocacy. Israel is a racist state! So, who wrote the definition? And why are so many countries adopting it? It was first drafted between 2004 and 2005 by two pro-Israel lobby groups. They're definitely not apolitical Jewish organizations. The definition was initially drafted for, quote, European data collectors to have a guideline for what to include and what to exclude in reports on anti-Semitism. That's according to one of the definition's main authors, Kenneth Stern. He's now one of its biggest opponents. He says that imposing it on college campuses would threaten academic freedom and that it would hurt pro-Israel activists, quote, because they will be seen as trying to suppress speech with which they disagree. Most importantly, he's against it because it might make it harder for racists who want to discriminate against Palestinians to express themselves. I'm not kidding. He says, quote, consider what speech might run afoul of an official definition of anti-Palestinian. Perhaps when a student says that he does not believe Palestinians have a right to a country of their own and that the West Bank instead should be part of a greater Israel? Despite the opposition, the IHRA definition was enthusiastically adopted by more than 20 countries, including the US, the UK, Canada, France, and Germany, as well as the EU and the UN's Secretary General. The definition is also being pushed onto universities and organizations. The adoption of the definition isn't meaningless. It has real effects on the lives of Palestine solidarity activists in every one of these countries, countries that play big roles in maintaining Israel's occupation of Palestine. Here are just a few examples of the definition in action. The UK was the first country to adopt the definition in 2016. Since then, charity events have been canceled. Israeli apartheid weeks have been banned. Activists and student leaders slandered. And a member of parliament has been forced to resign. Germany adopted the definition in 2017. And two years later... Germany is the first country in the European Union to declare that the Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions Movement, or BDS, is anti-Semitic. Yes, yes, BDS! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! The definition is used as a pretext to cancel events and silence activists. You have to recognize Israel's right to exist if you want to criticize Israel. The U.S. is a particularly interesting case. 
In just a few moments, I'll sign an executive order to combat anti-Semitism. It officially joined the club in 2019. A year before that, though, in 2018, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights quietly adopted the definition. The Office for Civil Rights is responsible for investigating claims of discrimination at schools and universities. That includes claims of anti-Semitism. The man behind the decision to adopt the definition Hello, was Kenneth, Kenneth Marcus. Marcus. Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights. Before working at the Office for Civil Rights, Marcus founded and worked at the Brandeis Center, an Israel lobby group that had been using civil rights laws to stifle pro-Palestine activity on college campuses for years, way before there was an IHRA definition to adopt. Here I am debating him about it back in 2013. Is political involvement in BDS in itself anti-Semitic in your view? I don't think that that movement per se is anti-Semitic. However, uh, there are certainly many different uh, BDS activities where we see people expressing anti-Semitic views in the course of being active in the BDS movement. People like Mr. Marcus and groups that are aligned with uh, the Israeli government and Israeli policy have been on a crusade to uh, conflate criticism of Israeli policies with uh, uh, this definition of anti-Semitism that has nothing to do with bigotry against Jews. Five years after this conversation, Al Jazeera's The Lobby came out. An undercover reporter embedded himself in the Israel lobby in the US. The reporter caught Marcus giving his honest opinion on the BDS movement. You have to show that they're racist hate groups. Uh, and that they are using intimidation to, uh, to get funded uh, and to consistently portray them that way. During his appointment at the Office for Civil Rights, Marcus inspired Israel lobby groups to file several complaints to the U.S. government. He also overlooked more than 400 other open appeals, including nearly 80 that had been pending for more than 10 years in order to prioritize a complaint from the Zionist Organization of America against Rutgers University. Palestine Legal and other civil rights organizations demanded Marcus be investigated for violating federal law, and he resigned soon after. The definition is still in place and has helped Zionist organizations launch dozens of complaints. Even though all the complaints have ultimately been thrown out, they tie up time and resources and chill speech. But despite all the attacks, students, student governments, colleges, and local governments continue to fight back against the definition. Because accusations of anti-Semitism aren't new to Palestine solidarity activists. They're just the latest tool in a decades-old toolbox. During and after Israel's latest assault on Gaza, we saw more and more people calling Zionism out as a racist settler colonial ideology. Unsurprisingly, what followed was a manufactured anti-Semitism crisis. Dangerous and drastic surge. That's what the Anti-Defamation League is saying about reports of anti-Semitism around the world since the fighting between Israel and Hamas began. In the U.S., nearly 200 anti-Semitic incident complaints in the week after the conflict started. A quick scan of the database mentioned shows that a lot of these, quote, incidents are people carrying signs that read Zionism equals racism or free Palestine. In New York's Times Square, a 29-year-old man wearing a yarmulke was punched, kicked, and pepper sprayed during an incident involving... As journalist Max Blumenthal points out, the man wasn't wearing a visible yarmulke. It was a hoodie. There was no way of knowing that the man was Jewish. The witness testimony corroborated the witness testimony I saw buried in media reports of the incident, which was that pro-Israel demonstrators on their way to a pro-Israel demonstration actually attacked the Palestinian young men on their way to a Palestine solidarity demonstration. So you basically have a story that's 180 degrees different than the official version of events which was conveyed to the American public about Jews just being beaten down. And it really creates the perception among at least some sector of Jewish Americans that they're under siege and that they need an Israel to protect them. 
And that's a very important point. As a settler colony, Israel needs two things to continue to survive, support both material and moral, and immigration. Israel can secure both these things by stoking fears of anti-Semitism abroad. The flight has just arrived. This is going to be exciting. Zionist lobbies push the idea that what's happening in Palestine is complex or too complicated for the ordinary person to really understand. But in reality, it's really simple. It's a fight against settler colonialism. The reality is that the fight against apartheid and occupation is intrinsically connected to the fight against anti-Semitism, as well as the fights against Islamophobia and all other kinds of racism. If you are outraged by cynical attempts to weaponize incidences of anti-Semitism, to smear Palestinians, and dismantle the movement for Palestinian liberation and advance Islamophobia, please say, we refuse. we refuse. So when it comes to standing in solidarity with Palestinians, take note of who's asking you to speak up and who is asking you to shut up.